A warm welcome back for the first place White Sox who took five of seven on the road from Toronto and Baltimore while holding the AL's best record. Tonight, Big Poppy comes to Chicago for his final regular season series at U.S. Cellular Field. It's the Red Sox and White Sox, and it's next. The first homestand in May for the Chicago White Sox shows the team in first place at 10 games over 500 as they greet the Red Sox out of the American League East here at U.S. Cellular Field this Tuesday evening. Thanks for joining us once again. Jason Benetti, Steve Stone along with you. The Sox finished that road trip. The offense, the defense, the pitching, all were pretty strong. Jose Quintana goes to the mound after a great road trip by everybody and He's been terrific this year. Let's take a look at him from last year against these Red Sox, and he was pretty close to unhittable. He's working on a streak of 16 straight scoreless innings, and last year, 2-0, the RA just over two, and the Red Sox just didn't see him at all. Five walks, 23 strikeouts overall, and hopefully tonight, more of the same. And that's what it's gonna look like. The knuckleballer, Stephen Wright, going to the mound. He's been absolutely brilliant. Jose Quintana has been just a little bit better, but both of them 2-0 in their last two starts. So hopefully the offense will come to life tonight because this Red Sox team can hit the baseball. You know, it's not every day you see a prospective Hall of Famer. David Ortiz, more than 500 career home runs. It's his last go around, at least in the regular season here at U.S. Cellular. The pitchers are not going to be disappointed that uh, Big Poppy is not going to play any longer. But this guy, if possible, is absolutely getting better. He's hitting 317, five home runs. He's driven in 19 runs. He stands right on top of the plate. He dares you to throw the fastball inside. And when you do, he puts a charge into it. And that's what the Sox have done over their last eight games, hitting 308, averaging close to six and a half runs, 23 doubles, 36 extra base hits. The most surprising thing, the stolen bases. They've been brilliant in that department. And with six games of 10 or more hits you would say that the Red Sox are certainly getting it done and we took the Orioles out of first place in Baltimore let's see if we can do that to the Red Sox as a new first place team in town in the American League East and they'll take on the White Sox first pitch from the south side of Chicago coming up next
White Sox Baseball on CSN Chicago is brought to you in part by Toyota. Discover more in a Toyota. Visit buyatoyota.com or your local Toyota dealer today. Let's go places. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois. Through it all. Audi. Truth in engineering. And by Xfinity. Xfinity X1 will change the way you experience TV. How does this sound to you? It's May 3rd, and the Boston Red Sox are in town to take on the first place Chicago White Sox. It's going to be a terrific baseball game because Boston is playing good, solid baseball. They're in first place, winners of eight of their last ten, so let's get it on. Let's do some lineup, shall we, or just one of them at least. Mookie Betts leads off some great young talent in his lineup. Ben Pedroia, you know about him. Xander Bogarts, the shortstop, just 23 years old. There's Big Poppy, Hanley Ramirez. Travis Shaw won the third base job. Then Chris Young, the journeyman, Ryan Hannigan, the catcher, and Jackie Bradley Jr., young center fielder, Steve. Let's take a look at how they're going to line up behind Jose Quintana for the game tonight as Robin has them with Melky Cabrera, Austin Jackson, Adam Eaton in the outfield. Todd Frazier, Jimmy Rollins back in the lineup with Brett Lowry, Jose Abreu in the infield, Deanna Navarro once again, the nod behind the plate. And our Lexus pursuing perfection starting pitcher is Jose Quintana looking for win number four, his ERA below one and a half. 32 strikeouts and 30 and two thirds. He's undefeated lifetime against these Red Sox. The umpires for the ball game: the crew chief Mike Everett behind the plate, Tim Timmons at first, Paul Emmel is at second, and the very large Jordan Baker is at third. So we are ready to play baseball on what has turned into a beautiful night. 67 degrees. The wind not much of a factor, and let's see if we can cool off. The Red Sox. They've won three straight series. They just swept the Yankees, and a team coming in at 15 and 10, first place in the American League East, and another good road team at seven and three to open the season here in 2016. Quintana, 16 innings consecutive, scoreless. His first pitch is a strike. Wheels up time tonight is 7-10 from U.S. Cellular Field. Well, the best young players around, Mookie Betts, made the conversion from an infielder to an outfielder very smoothly. Inside, ball and a strike. He's currently, Mookie Betts is, the league leader in plate appearances. He's been up 119 times, just his age 23 season. This lineup has terrorized American League pitchers. They're hitting 285. First by a wide margin over Baltimore, and that's one of the reasons why Mookie keeps getting the bat. John Farrell, the skipper, looking on. Fouled away two and two for Mookie Betts, who is leading the team in runs scored. You said it, the Red Sox have hit the ball very well at 285 for the year, second best in Major League Baseball. The homer number is not there for Farrell's team. However, they're the best doubles team so far in Major League Baseball with 67 of them. You also, being the observant fellow that you are, pointed out another rarity about this lineup, which is somewhat hard to believe. They are leading the league in a characteristic and in a statistic that they never lead the league in. I forgot what it is. I'm not that observant. Oh, stolen bases. Just in case. <laughs> 22 <laughs> out of 24 in bags this year. As Mookie Betts will see a seventh pitch from Quintana. Pretty amazing the fact that this lineup, which has a lot of veterans in it, has some good enough young players with decent enough speed where they're taking advantage of the American League catchers. Mookie Betts is six out of six in stolen bases. They may test the honor Navarro tonight. And Betts continues. To fight off pitches from Quintana. He's faced him six times with a couple of hits, including a double. Betts just keeps getting better, and really, we haven't seen the ceiling yet. This is a young man that they thought would ever be an everyday shortstop or second baseman for the Red Sox. Foul of third, and the at bat continues. They have so much talent in their system right now that there's there's been a backlog of players in the outfield in Triple A for years. It's a good problem to have as Dave Dombrowski has found out since coming over and running the organization that he has a wealth of talent having to shift a lot of players to different places. In the air from Betts. 
And Jimmy Rollins takes charge for out number one tonight. Took nine pitches, but Quintana finally gets rid of Mookie Betts and brings up the very scrappy Dustin Pedroia. Pedroia entirely healthy this year. One of the reasons why he's hitting 324. He's a deadly high fastball hitter, but this year, unlike years past, he's hitting the ball to right and right center, and that's what's got that batting average up where it is. So you say he's a, he's a good high fastball hitter. Where would you pitch him watching him historically? Well, until this year, you go outside, you keep it thigh to the knee, and you're in pretty good shape because he's going to roll over and ground it to the left side. Fisted to right center. Adam Eaton, who's played a stellar right field, is there for the second out in the first inning. Very good pitch by Quintana because he got the called strike on the first pitch, so now you're up 0 and 1. You go inside, a little further inside, and you get a guy in the defensive at bat just trying to guard the plate against the 0 2. Doesn't get anything into the swing. 320 hitter last year, Xander Bogarts at 306. To open play this season. He's got an 11 game on base streak, another one of those very youthful and super talented players. He speaks four languages fluently English, Spanish, Dutch, and am I happy that he speaks Papiamento because it gives me something to converse with him in? He's relatable for you. Yes. You're still working on English. Right, but Papiamento is my native language. Where are you from? Somewhere where they speak Papiamento. They have dialects of Papiamento in Ohio. Yes. I see. I was born in the South, South Euclid. Breaking ball, just missed. Borderline pitch. Actually, as I traveled through Aruba, that's when I picked it up. Yeah, you've been yeah. through the ABC Islands. Well, just Aruba is at the A. I missed the B and the C. Three balls and a strike. On Bogarts. He's a very good young player, and at first, defense was a problem. But not so anymore. He worked with Brian Butterfield, who's a great infield coach, and he really got him to settle down, and now he's considered a plus defender. Adam Eaton for out number three. Bonaire and Curacao, the other two. You've already learned something tonight, Stone. No score after a half inning tonight. Turret tonight in a scoreless game in the first. Eaton Rollins of Brayu, as we've seen so much. Frazier, Cabrera, Laurie, Jerry Sands back in there with Avi Garcia still shelved with a hamstring injury. Navarro and Jackson. Red Laurie, home run in three straight games. Now Farrell's going to line him up this way. Chris Young, Jackie Bradley Jr., and Mookie Betts in the outfield with Shaw, Bogart, Pedroia, and Ramirez in the infield. Ryan Hannigan behind the plate. And Stephen Wright, the knuckleballer on the hill. Hannigan already has seven pass balls, and Wright 
Two and two but a sparkling 137 ERA. He'll throw his knuckleball a little bit harder than we saw from R.A. Dickey. He'll also use a curveball which is something that most knuckleballers don't do. First pitch is a strike to Adam Eaton who's hitting 283 this year. And a lot like R.A. Dickey if you see the ball up that's the pitch you go after. Already just watching a couple pitches the movement is more significant than we saw early in the game from R.A. Dickey in that game in Toronto. Well he had a lot of help from Tim Wakefield and Wakefield as you know one of the great knuckleballers of previous vintage. Eaton strokes this ball to center field and Adam Eaton slams on the brakes with a leadoff single right now the best position player by wins above replacement in Major League Baseball is on again. Adam Eaton off to a great start and he does see a knuckleball all the way even though it drifts on the outside corner he takes him right back up the middle. So a promising way to start. He's talking to Greg Sparks the assistant hitting coach for the Sox in Toronto before they game with R.A. Dickey. I said what's it like to hit a knuckleball his answer was you ever take a wiffle ball bat and try to hit a butterfly. It's approximately how you have to catch it. Very difficult to do either. But our Sox lineup for whatever reason always has fared pretty well against knuckleballers. See if that continues tonight. Top foul by Rollins nothing in two for a Sox lineup that now is up to 14th in baseball and batting average 244. You know, the first couple series people were saying I wonder how the hitting is going to progress for Todd Steverson and the answer is up up and up during that road trip. Big comeback win at Baltimore on Saturday. Pedroia to second for one, and that is all they will get. Four to six on the fielder's choice. Eaton retired, replaced by Rollins. Adam looked like he wanted to run. He actually took a couple of steps, and this knuckleball is hit right at Pedroia, but it's a slow developing play, and no chance at all for Bogarts, who's got a pretty strong arm. Legal slide going directly to the bag that came into play during the road trip on a possible second triple play for the Sox, which wasn't to be. Strike one to Jose Abreu, who's got two hits in five of his last six games. He also hits R.A. Dickey very well, so it's going to be interesting with a knuckleballer who throws it a little bit harder if he can have the same kind of luck. He's hit three home runs lifetime against Dickey. Hit the ball pretty well against him in Toronto. And we'll see how that translates this evening. A couple of first place teams tonight from U.S. Cellular Field. So what's the difference? I mean, hard knuckleball, soft knuckleball, they're, they're both fluttering, right? It's just that you don't have as much time if the knuckleball is harder, especially if it does flutter as much as the one that he throws more softly but it's pitcher preference because it depends on how you decide to throw it as far as when you come up and you learn it because Wright has said that it's not like any other pitch that you've ever thrown it goes completely against everything you've always learned as a conventional pitcher you have to use it with a stiff wrist instead of using your wrist to get the movement you have to kind of push the ball off your fingers instead of throwing it off your fingers it's a different indoctrination. Inside two and one on Abreu. You know, Sox are 18 and eight. They finished April nine over, and Jose Abreu still isn't putting up the sizable numbers that we've seen from him in the past. That's a good sign for the Sox, you would imagine. Well, he's driven in 14, and he's starting to drive in some big runs. Abreu socks this ball right center field. Bradley back. It's off the top of the wall and clings away from him. Rollins peels away for home. Abreu digging for third. It's an RBI triple in the first inning. And the White Sox lead by a run. Greatest way to hit a knuckleball is let it come to you. Just don't go out and get it. And Jose did exactly that. Driving in his 15th run of the year. 
And this knuckleball you see with no spin Jose just waited on it and hit it off the wall. Not surprisingly that's his first triple of the year and it bounds away from Bradley. And he's 90 feet away from making it two to nothing as Jose sees it get away and then he speeds it up a bit. Well of all the people on the Sox roster as Frazier fouls this one off that are thinking three out of the box. The gentleman from Cienfuegos is likely not the first candidate. No and it took a precipitous hop off the wall getting away from Bradley who is a magnificent center fielder. Sixth career triple for Abreu. And Frazier didn't go ball to strike. Henley Ramirez who's made the conversion to a first baseman done a pretty good job of it this year. He's in on the grass at first base. The middle infielders are not in all that far but they're in about halfway. Two balls and a strike on Frazier. Great RBI opportunity with a runner at third and one down. Well, the Red Sox had been the team scoring in nine of the last 12 games, the first inning coming in, that had done the damage early. Two and two for Frazier, who's seeing Stephen Wright. For the first time in the majors. And with Hannigan behind the plate, you take a lot of pressure off Christian Vasquez, who's our number one catcher and one of the great prospects around. It's hard to catch a knuckleball. Hard to hit it, too. Strike three on Frazier. Two out in the Sox first. This one absolutely didn't come down. Don thought it might. But the ball just stayed up on one plane and kind of drifted away from him. Gives the infield in the middle a chance to move back. And Melky Cabrera with an RBI opportunity with two out. That was a curveball. So good way to start him off if you intend to get it over the plate. Melky has not missed many pitches this year. Melky one of the best in baseball at making contact. That will be put to the test tonight, however. Ball to strike on Melky Cabrera, who's got eight RBIs this year, just one in his last eight games. Really turned it up the prior homestand. And a chance to add to the total here. 12 walks, only seven strikeouts for Melky. Left field and Young for out number three. But the Sox get the RBI triple from Jose Abreu, and the White Sox lead the Red Sox 1 0 for Quintana.
for the Red Sox in the second inning at U.S. Cellular Field. That is a large jackpot for you folks who are so inclined. Steve is currently texting in his numbers. Well, I actually believe that I'm going to allow the other folks to have a shot at that. Oh, that's gracious of you. Yeah. It really is. Ordinarily, I would. I just don't start before 500 million or so. Yeah, uh, you know. Uh, everybody's got a price. <laughs> Quintana will face David Ortiz, Hanley Ramirez, Travis Shaw in the second inning. And Big Poppy with 508 career homers, third most active in Major League Baseball, and your final opportunity, at least in the regular season, to see him at U.S. Cellular Field. Kind of unbelievable that he truly is getting better. Over the last three years, this is the best he's looked and the best he's swung. That ball is crushed to center field. Jackson is back. He jumps, and Austin Jackson reels it in. And Big Poppy with applause for that catch. I think he believed it was going out of the ballpark, and perhaps on another night it would have. But not tonight. 400 to straightaway center field. Austin Jackson gets a very good jump. Big Poppy puts a charge into it, but not quite far enough as Austin, top of his leap, perfectly timed. And Big Poppy said, Yep, I appreciate it. It's a that, nice catch. That's how the farewell tour is supposed to go. He hits the ball hard, crowd gets a rise out of it, and the White Sox get the out. But David Ortiz is really something. Now Hanley Ramirez who's played a very solid first base this year for the Red Sox he takes strike one. Red Sox are hoping that he comes back to life because they gave him four years at 88 million and things have not gone very well especially on the defensive side. And the fact that Ramirez has been nicked up since putting on that Red Sox uniform as you look at a man who is no doubt in my mind at least ticketed to the Hall of Fame. I don't think there's any way he stays out of the Hall of Fame. You David Ortiz. Yes I do. Ball to strike from Quintana to Ramirez. It's off the plate outside two and one. You realize what he's done over the course of his career. Start out with Minnesota. Boston got him in. 2003. As a free agent, Minnesota let him go. Yeah, they had first base prospects coming up at the time. And David really wasn't their type of player. At that point, they wanted guys who can run, those guys who can field very well. And David, well, all he does is drive in 100 runs a year and swings the bat with anybody in the game. 595 doubles, 508 home runs. And by the way, he's got 18 triples in his 20 year career. Two thousand thirteen, he hit 309, 30 home runs, 103 driven in. Then 14, 35 home runs, 104 driven in. Last year, 37 home runs, 108 driven in. So he keeps on getting better. And the numbers he's starting off with should be better than last year, assuming he can keep it up. 2 2 to Ramirez is inside on a fastball, 3 and 2. The Red Sox have not seen many left handed pitchers this year. Only two lefty starters have gone against Boston this season. And coming into this game, only 126 plate appearances overall in 25 games against lefties. And with the Sox pending move that Rick Hahn announced earlier this afternoon, the White Sox, that is. Uh, John Danks has lost his spot in the rotation. He's going to be designated for assignment as of Thursday. And Eric Johnson is coming up at least to temporarily take that spot in the rotation, which Rick Hahn said was a very fluid spot in the rotation for Robin Ventura, who is sharing a laugh with Joe McEwing. Well, well, and having worked with Johnny Danks uh, the last going on nine years now. You can't find a more professional guy around uh, a fiercer competitor. I mean it was a very tough day in the clubhouse for the Sox players those who know John very well. 
because he is a wonderful man and we can only wish him the best. Three and two. And what Rick Hahn said rings really true to somebody like you who's been around the team for a long time that if not for the arm trouble that John Danks had you never know what he could have been later on in his career for this team. He feels like that directly related to the trouble that he's had. Yeah when, when you sign a guy to a long term deal and then later into the sign he has surgery on his arm everything changes and for John he never came back quite the same. Fouled away again by Ramirez. Johnny Danks 247 starts the longest tenured Chicago White Sox player coming into this season. And this year for him and he realized that he just didn't have location when you make mistakes with what he was throwing this year he had gotten hurt. I don't think it came as a big surprise to him it's just not the happiest day for the Sox. Abreu off the bag spears it and in a race beats Ramirez to the line for out number two heads up play by Jose because he realized that Quintana was not going to make it to the bag he was not going to be able to beat Ramirez he started out as a bit of a spectator and then Jose picked it up right away I mean he could see that he got turned around and knowing that it's a race and he wins it with a slide good heads up play by the big man at first. So two down for Travis Shaw who won this job in spring training over at third base a former first baseman for the Red Sox has had a very successful first month hitting 322 and slugging 533. He is awfully strong drafted in the ninth round in 2011. In shirt in search of a position. In the air foul ground and Frazier with momentum straight for the dugout. Six in a row retired by Quintana to open tonight. Eighth, and the White Sox have dedicated this Saturday, May 7th, as Mother's Son Night at the ballpark. In addition to specially priced tickets and parade passes, the first 20,000 fans will receive a Chris Sale K counter bobblehead. To purchase tickets, visit whitesox.com slash mom. And if at some point during the game, Steve sounds like he's not paying attention, he's just playing with his Chris Sale K counter over in the corner, just ringing up the numbers as you're wont to do. And we're not going to show it to you yet, but our prize shelf contains a gnome. It does. A White Sox gnome. And his name is Goofball the Gnome, it seems. Well, we have one of those. We will show you as we move along. Ball one to Brett Laurie, who for the first time in his career has homered in three straight games. We got a lot of good stuff on the prize shelf today. For Sox math, coming up in a bit. Inside 
2 and 0. It's not easy for the umpire either no. on a knuckleball. No, you really have to stay with it because nobody really knows which way it's going to break or flutter or move. Wright's thrown his fastball for a strike 75% of the time. And if you're a knuckleballer, you've got to do that. And there's an example of it. That was a fastball. At 83. Yeah. Two balls and a strike for Laurie. Sox leading 1 0 over Boston and 3 and 1. Stephen Wright, about 85% knuckleball this year. Three balls and two strikes on Laurie, a guy who wasn't a knuckleball pitcher. He came up, made it to double A in the Indians farm system. And then decided he, as so many do, needed to scrap it, do something different, picked up the knuckleball, and you mentioned has learned a lot from Tim Wakefield. As Lori pops this one foul. Well, as a knuckleballer, what happens is, and it certainly was true in the case of Wright, he was on the verge of leaving baseball. And he was dropped from the 40-man roster, and they mentioned to him. It might likely happen again and he determined that if he wasn't on the 40 man roster he was going to go home and look for other pursuits. That's outside nice take by Lori ball four, his 13th walk of the year. That's another surprising stat because this is not a guy who last year walked a great deal. So the fact that he is much more selective this year getting on base at the bottom part of the order giving an opportunity for the bottom part to produce some runs. Where Jerry Sands has resided the last couple of days, and he's hit the ball well, four for his last eight up to 321. Like a curveball, one and oh, to Lori, uh, to Sands. And speaking of Lori, his walk percentage last year, four and a half percent. Five and a half percent the year before this season coming into play today, 11 percent. It's pretty much the reason why he's hitting at 290 because he's been much more selective. You're talking about the 40 man roster. Right. And for fans who are not aware, you can have an extra 15 guys on your roster who are in the minors somewhere, and essentially you can bring them up whenever you'd like without having to pass them through waivers when they go back to the minors. And the 40 man means you get an automatic invite to spring training which is where you can show your bosses that you can actually do it. You can come to spring training as a non roster player but then if the team has to make a move they have to drop somebody from the 40 man and add you to it. That becomes at some point the reason you stay in the minor leagues. So being on the 40 man is a good place to be. So when you hear a team saying that somebody's been designated for assignment that means that player has been pulled off the 40 man roster and needs to pass through waivers if they're going to end up in triple A or double A wherever it might be or go on to other places somewhere else yeah. right. One and two on Sands. It's downstairs two balls and two strikes and so the Sox opened this season with a couple of spots left open on the 40 man roster so you can get a guy like Hector Sanchez purchase his contract and bring him up from Charlotte without having to drop someone off the 40 man roster. So sometimes you have fewer than 40 on the roster right so so you can have that flexibility. Occasionally that'll happen not too often but occasionally because you never know especially with a with an organization that's kind of in a state of flux as far as guys nailing down specific jobs and the Sox were like that adding a lot of moving parts in the spring. Called strike three on Jerry Sands and one away. You know we haven't gotten our picks to click in tonight Steve. Why don't we do that. I would say do it here. That, that's, a, that's a very good idea. Melky Cabrera for the crew. You're going with Jerry Sands. And I took Brett Laurie a lot of people on Twitter using the hashtag pick to click selected Brett Laurie but I especially like Daniel Tate's reason he said pick Laurie just trust me on this one 
Well, there you go. That's How can you argue with that? No. It's you essentially. Can't possibly. It's a great argument. The only better argument is, come on. Come on. <laughs> Throw to first on Laurie. One on, one out for Deanna Navarro. Nothing more riveting than a good 40-man roster conversation on a Tuesday night, right? But it's important. I mean, it's important to know about. Well, it certainly was important in the career of Stephen Wright because it eventually got him to the major leagues where he is in the middle of a rotation that is having a few difficulties with the guy that they thought would be up at the top of the rotation. That's Clay Buckholz, who's really struggled in the early going. Sox scheduled to see Clay Buckholz in this series. One nothing White Sox over the Red Sox at a 1 1 count on Navarro who's got a hit in seven of his last eight and generally regular playing time helps a guy get into the hitting groove right. Well, Alex Avila having nicked up his hamstring and on the DL afforded Deanna a chance to play more and he even mentioned yeah more consistent at bats he's going to see the ball better. Second base Pedroia the shovel for one and the double play. So Wright gets the Red Sox to turn two and it's one nothing after two. White Sox and Red Sox as they close out their series. Coverage starts at 6.30 with White Sox pregame live. Presented by the Koalas family of dealerships on CSN+. Plus. Scheduled starters in that game, Henry Owens and Eric Johnson. We'd like to welcome all of our viewers watching on Dish Network to a 1-0 lead for the White Sox. By the way, you're in the game notes today, in the White Sox game notes that we get delivered here. Do you know that? Your game notes famous tonight. Oh, good. Yeah. Did I do anything recently? Well, it's because you're not doing the series in New York. Ah. It's about your fill in. Oh, Mr. Plesak. Yeah. Dan Plesak, a wonderful man, was a great pitcher. Yeah. Has and been known to tune into a White Sox game or two this year. And a left handed reliever for a while, one of the better closers around. That's very nice of you. I'll let him close out the Yankee series. Yankees are. Scuffling right now, eight and fifteen as Chris Young floats this ball to left field and Melky Cabrera for out number one. We see a bit of an idea, although the wind is not all that much of a factor. What wind there is is going to take it out to left and left center field because Young didn't get a whole lot of that, but he got enough of it to take it out almost to the track. So seven in a row set aside by Quintana, and here's Ryan Hannigan. Hannigan last year surprisingly walked 10 percent of the time which for a guy that wasn't swinging the bat all that well was somewhat surprising. Oh. 
couple of years ago he went from the Rays to the Padres in a three team deal back on December 19th of 2014. Then later that day he was traded again from the Padres to the Red Sox for Will Middlebrooks the former Red Sox third baseman. You ever traded twice in one day. No I was never traded during the season. I was traded in the offseason. Well this was. But you never. No. Not twice in one day. No. They never offloaded you that fast. No they probably would have liked to. Nobody would have done it the second time. Laurie for out number two. Second ground out out of eight outs for the Red Sox. Pretty good so far for Quintana who's kept it to a minimum of pitches because he's not striking anybody out which is not a bad thing. He has stayed on top of these guys seven out of eight first pitch strikes and a total of 35 pitches is Bradley Junior will take his opportunity yeah, Jackie Bradley Junior the triples leader in Major League Baseball with four of them in April take strike one he's a magnificent center fielder a very good arm gets great jumps on it and he like Mookie Betts and Xander Bogarts continues to get better. Right field Adam Eaton driven back and he's there again to climb the wall for fun. The best defensive player in Major League Baseball the first month of the season. A little Spider-Man act. Bottom three next. White Sox checking and an official White Sox MasterCard debit card only available at your local Wintrust Community Bank. Go to Wintrust.com slash Sox to learn more. Wintrust Community Bank member FDIC. Beautiful night for baseball here. Jason Benetti, Steve Stone, our entire crew and our prize shelf tonight. How about that? We got a lot of stuff. We got a Snickers bar that's named after Steve. It's his goofball on yeah, it. Yeah, and we've also got a gnome. I mean, how many of you have actually been able to win a gnome in any contest you've ever been in? Well, Great here point. he is, the Sox gnome, and we've got a, a statue back there. I saw that. What is that? That is a statue. <laughs> Yeah, funny you should ask. You could win a statue. Yeah, you could. Folks at home, and you have the chance to do it next half inning with another edition of Sox Math using your Twitter or your audio Twitter, as Steve does sometimes, at Steve Stone. You can tweet at Steve <laughs> and maybe win a statue. <laughs> I'm still looking at the Chris Sale K counter, which is really a very nice item to have. Without mentioning the T-shirt from Free T-shirt Thursday coming up as well, and I'll have to dig into my bag of tricks to get the signed Altoids tin. It's We've not up there. Well, look, that's a special prize for special nights. Group three and zero on Austin Jackson, swinging away now three and one. It's pretty good game plan because of three and zero. You're probably not going to see a knuckleball. That was a fastball. It was very hittable up in the zone. 
Austin just fouled it straight back. Give me another fastball. Fouled away three and two. Rare to see back to back fastballs from the knuckleballer. Then. Well to give you an idea on a fastball at 82 83 miles an hour Austin was late on it expecting anything but that second fastball. Payoff pitch is upstairs lead off walk for Austin Jackson. By the way Twitter has let us know that Dan Fleesack is actually watching the game so your kind words have gone directly to the source. Well Dan. Has always been a terrific guy. I think he's a very good broadcaster, and I think he'll have a whole lot of fun broadcasting for this club for three games because this has been an exciting team this year. Maybe we'll get Dan to play socks math tonight. Do you think he'll send in an answer? If it's uh, racehorse related, yes. <laughs> Adam Eaton looks at strike one. Going to break, we were talking about how strong Adam Eaton has been in the field. There's this. Statistic called defensive run saved. We've talked about it a little bit this year. It's essentially how well you do at keeping runs off the board compared to the average fielder at your position. He's at 12 for the year. Nobody else in Major League Baseball has hit seven. It's been a pretty amazing run, and we saw it ending last inning, keeping Jose Quintana perfect. Just a great catch off the bat of Jackie Bradley Jr., bidding for. Possibly a three base hit. Adam took yet another one away. There you see the difficulty of catching the knuckleball from Hannigan. Menard's pitch tracks will show you one that's way off the plate, and Hannigan was able to make that catch unbelievably. And now we'll see if perhaps Jackson's going to take off. He holds and another ball outside three and one for Eaton. What do you think three and one send him here. No only because you're likely to see a fastball. Or some variation of curveball three and one. Last thing that Wright wants to do is walk back to back hitters. Which he does right there ball four two on. Now that was a fastball at. 84 but he missed by plenty. So a golden opportunity to add to that lead and the way the Red Sox can hit leading the league offensively by a wide margin it's good to get some early runs. And there's probably only one thing more difficult than hitting a knuckleball and that is bunting a knuckleball. You mean a stationary horizontal piece of wood. <laughs> it's. And it's, a wiffle ball. It's difficult to do. Jackson at second, Eaton at first. Rollins tries it out. Well, you saw the movement of that one, and I mean, it dove in drastically at the last minute. And Jimmy is just looking like, how did that ball do that? It's up there for a bit, and then just dives down and in, and he fouls it off. The look on his face says basically please don't make me do that again. <laughs> foul ball foul ball nothing in two. On Rollins who. When we were in Toronto. He said he would hit R.A. Dickey very well but never figured out Tim Wakefield. He tried to do it left handed he tried to do it right handed and Wakefield being. The knuckleball whisperer in some ways for Stephen Wright. It's got to be at least comparable to what he saw from Wakefield. Well, he managed a ground ball the first time up. Let's see what he's going to try here. Probably another knuckleball, I would think, 0 2. Ball and two strikes on Jimmy Rollins. Abreu next. Frazier to follow. And the lone run on the board for the White Sox on a Jose Abreu RBI triple. There is Jose. Who's got an RBI in four straight games. Two and two for Rollins. 
What's the pitch limit on a knuckleball guy? 170? He can do. Usually they can go as long as they have to go. Normally it's the hitters that tell you when your time is up. It's not the pitching coach or the manager that'll take you out. Two and two. Rollins a pull shot and foul. Eaton and Jackson both walked here in the third. Series opener of three between the White Sox and Red Sox. Tipped it foul. Hannigan couldn't hang on. Dunking with a lot of catchers about the knuckleball, you see where he has the glove. He tries to keep his loose as loose as he can. That's Hannigan. He doesn't really give the pitcher a target because it's useless. He can't throw it at a target anyway. You try to throw it right down the middle and let the ball do all of the work. Sounds like a real good time catching a knuckleball. First base side gets the job done just like a bunt. Three unassisted. Eaton to second, Jackson to third. Well, in Toronto. We had a talk with Buck Martinez, broadcaster and former major league catcher, and he talked about catching the knuckleball. He has a good job to just make some contact, move the runners along, and now the man who's responsible for driving in the lone run has an opportunity for more. It is Jose Abreu, whose RBI triple made it one nothing White Sox. And with the first White Sox run, E Click Lending has donated $100 to the Pat Tillman Foundation supporting military veterans and their families. Joe McEwing fired up in the third base coaching box. Joel send you now. Inside, two balls, no strikes on Abreu. Well, this situation first base open you wonder about the unintentional intentional walk but can Stephen Wright even do that without knowing where the knuckleball is necessarily headed. No a unless he goes with a fastball and then just tries to keep it away. And that one one of the harder knuckleballs he's thrown at 78 that ball almost took off over the head of Hannigan. I would think it's going to be a ball four. I mean, once you move to three and oh, there's no reason to risk him hitting the ball awfully hard, which is something he's been doing. So bases loaded on three walks here in the third inning for the White Sox. And a meeting coming at the mound. So we get a look at Carl Willis, the pitching coach. Former Minnesota twin, one year with the White Sox, a couple seasons with Cincinnati, and originally with the Detroit Tigers. First year pitching coach for Boston. Well, right now he's thinking about what happened last time against Frazier, how he worked them in. Not thinking about career with the bases loaded, a couple of grand slams for Todd, hitting in the 230s. On the ground, should get a run home, and it will. Jackson scores, Eaton to third, Abreu to second, Frazier drives in his 18th. Another big run. He got the knuckleball, hit the top of the baseball, and hit it so slowly that Shaw could only do one thing, and that's go to first base. So Shaw, who was a first baseman before shifting across the diamond to third, he couldn't decide. They couldn't decide between a handshake or hugs. They just hugged it out. A warm embrace for Austin Jackson. 
well, scored they, the second run. They also show you what happens in leadoff walk situations. Wright was able to get away with the leadoff walk last inning, but not this inning. Sox have a run without the benefit of a hit. And there's a strike to Melky Cabrera, who you said it earlier. He's one of the top 15 guys in Major League Baseball in fewest swings and misses by percentage for the season. It's been a remarkable start for Melky. One and two. But against a good knuckleball, you can pretty much take most everything out of the equation because it's not like anything you've seen a whole lot of. Fouled away. The Sox do have at least somebody on the team who does toy with a knuckleball. Matt Leto says sometimes when he's getting ready before a game, he'll mess around with a knuckleball, just throw it once or twice to get the feeling of it off his hand. So just in case he needs a How's second saying, career. Not a bad idea if you can master it. You can stay around seemingly forever. Nicely done by Wright to get Melky, but the Sox get a run to lead the Red Sox 2-0. Shelf use the hashtag SoxMath. Here's the problem tonight. The number of regular season home games scheduled for a Major League Baseball club. Subtract Albert Bell's single season Sox doubles record. Add the number of home runs David Ortiz has hit at U.S. Cellular Field entering tonight. Subtract the number of games the Sox were over 500 this April. That's your Sox Math question. Hashtag SoxMath. First correct answer wins a prize off the prize shelf. A lot of run for the gnome already on Twitter tonight. I would assume that that's going to be huge. Huge, I tell you. How many opportunities do you have at a gnome? You don't get to win a gnome very often, especially on a Tuesday. One and one for Mookie Betts as Quintana has gone nine up, nine down so far. Strike two on Mookie Betts. Who's hitting 321 his last 12 games. Just one hit against lefties though this year and two and two. Mookie originally signed as a fifth round draft pick in 2011. Last year hit 291. First full season in the major leagues. Very impressive. Off the plate, three and two. In a 36 game on base streak last year from August through October. 
at age 22. Rollins at short has the out one gone. Well Jimmy knew that he had to go to his left and then quickly get it across. Just a reminder as you enjoy a cold one to look forward to Miller time later in the game brought to you by Miller Lite. I look forward to that. Your reading of that every night. I look forward to you telling me that Miller time is coming. But we have to wait to just get the explicit moment. That is the first base runner tonight for the Boston Red Sox. It comes in batter at number 11 with Dustin Pedroia. If you see where the pitch is, you'll realize why Pedroia has always been one of the best high fastball hitters in the major leagues. I mean, this is a, a former MVP and as Ozzie used to call him affectionately, we got beat by a jockey. So as an MVP, 5-6 is fairly unusual in today's game, but Pedroia can really do it, and this year he's having a bounce back year after some injuries the last few. Ball one to Xander Bogarts. What, Lafitte Pinkai? Which one is he? Pretty much. Yeah. Out of Arizona State originally, first round draft pick. Could be two. Laurie feeds Rollins to Abreu. Inning over. Four, six, three, just like that. For Quintana, the middle infield partnership does the trick. Italian Roots with Italian Heritage Night presented by Beggar's Pizza Friday, May 6th. Italian Heritage Night features specially priced tickets and a post-game fireworks show to purchase tickets. Visit WhiteSox.com slash Italy. And if you buy those tickets, you can get the brilliant Steve Stone styled White Sox fedora. Yes, but I also want to mention that I don't know if you get you get pictures with your tweets because you had a picture on there that I don't care what answer she gave, but I would definitely pick her as tonight's winner. Uh, she looks like she could are, use a gnome. We are not allowed to pick winners based on anything other than the correct answer. Thank you for asking, though. Okay, well, I had 41 before you even asked the question. You did? Is, is that the answer? Uh, it is, yeah. Well, there you go. Thank you. Thank you for playing. Brett Laurie with a big swing and a miss. Jose Quintana has faced the minimum thus far tonight, and he's been staked to a 2 0 lead. And now he's getting great run support suddenly. I mean, two. He had the triple play. Well, two against a guy that they haven't seen very much of, whether you're looking at tape or anything else. You've got to really 
get a feel for how the knuckleball is working on a given evening and it's not like they're facing R.A. Dickey who they've seen many times. So getting a feel for the speed of the knuckleball and he's thrown it as fast as 78 miles an hour which is a fairly quick knuckleball. You spend your off time clocking knuckleballs. I do. It's a, it's a, you know it's a, it's a hobby. And uh, not a good one, but a hobby nonetheless. Some people play Parcheesi. You nope. sit at knuckleball festivals with radar guns. Xander Bogarts. Out number one. Sox entering play tonight. The White Sox, that is. 18 and 8, three games up on Detroit in the Central. The Royals lost yesterday to Dusty Baker's Nationals in shutout fashion. One game over. Cleveland is 10 and 12. The Minnesota Twins, who are coming in for the weekend series during this homestand, 8 and 18 at the outset of play today. Nothing and one on Jerry Sands. I'm interested in who you're most surprised by team wise at the start of this Major League Baseball season. For me it's pretty easy and it's not in a good way and it's Houston. Really? Because a whole lot of people felt that Houston would follow up on last year and if not dominate the West they would certainly be right there all year long and it hasn't started out that way. Houston in fact eight and eighteen and one of the surprising things last year's Cy Young Award winner Dallas Keuchel is not throwing the ball particularly well. And so a team that dominated at home last year just four and seven at home four and eleven on the road so it's been a tough start for the Astros. Just lost to Minnesota yesterday in that series opener. They're just not hitting their their 227 team batting average is second worst to Tampa at 221. Two and two for Sands. That was a knuckleball that you had a chance to hit it stayed up didn't do a whole lot but Jerry fouled it straight back and there shifted around just a touch to right center field. Pretty hard to shift at all with a knuckleball pitcher not knowing exactly where the ball is going. The Red Sox. After a couple of consultations by Pablo Sandoval announced that he did have surgery and he's going to miss the rest of the year. So James Andrews performed the surgery in Pensacola Florida. Called strike three on Sands Honda pitch tracks has it as a very good strike. And two away. Two up, two called thirds, and this one had the whole plate. And Jerry looked back, he actually saw the glove of Hannigan because the ball was going down when he caught it. He took it down lower, but it came over the plate, a strike by a lot. I, how tough is it on a hitter visually? what we're seeing tonight as as Navarro stands in and takes a strike because it's so completely different than anything they've seen it is very difficult you're hoping to get away with something up in the zone that comes in rolling or tumbling as they call it not fluttering as the good knuckleballs do. Oh and two on Navarro. Best knuckleball you've ever seen. Phil Necro. Yeah. I got to the point after a couple of the bats where I decided to swing in the same place every time. <laughs> it didn't matter where the ball was, I would swing in the same place. And the third one literally dove into my bat and I got a base hit to left field. No, you didn't. It was a miracle. And Navarro thought he struck out. Well, the second pitch was out of the zone. He got it called that time. It was in the zone. He didn't get it called. Again, difficult 
for everyone concerned for the umpire to call it the catcher to catch it and certainly for the hitter to hit it. Fouled off by Deanna Navarro. Mentioned the White Sox with that three game lead in the central that is actually by far the largest divisional lead in the American League right now Texas was up a half game in the West and the Red Sox up a half game entering play tonight on the Orioles who the Sox just split with over the weekend. Wright spears it and finishes off the fourth inning to the fifth we go. Answer the number of regular season home games is 81. Subtract the 48 doubles for Albert Bell. Add David Ortiz's 17 homers in this year ballpark and minus nine games over 500 this April. Some folks thought 10 because they're currently 10 over. The White Sox played 17 wins in April. They picked up another win in May. The answer is 41. The winner is at Wright Sox, who also levied the first correct upheld appeal in Sox math history. Congratulations to you and your fake law degree. <laughs> David Ortiz leads off and takes a strike. Well, David hit the daylights out of one. Fortunately, Austin Jackson went back to the track, hauled it in, well timed, leaped up at the top of his jump, and made the catch. We're talking during the break about a strange number that arose. From one of your readings before this game started about David Ortiz. Just want to know how many guys in the history of baseball in their 40s at 30 home runs and drove in 100. And in combing back through the history of the game, and bear in mind, I mean, you go back past Custer's last stand and all those kind of Big things. Big horn. Nobody, right, nobody has ever done that. David Ortiz this year is hoping to become the first man ever. 30 and 100 in the power numbers. He's got a good start on it. Barry Bonds at his 40s at age 41 he hit 26 homers drove in 77 age 42 28 homers knocked in 66. Three and two from Quintana. Not a strikeout not a walk so far. Ortiz is difficult because he's right on top of the plate. And he can drive the ball to left center as easily as he can to right. Breaking ball buckled his knees strike three. He hadn't seen a curveball all night and he just has to shake his head because Jose waited a long time to break this out. And when he did. Big poppy with no chance whatsoever. Look at the knees. Right there. He just looks at it 
All he can do is walk away. He knows it was a perfect pitch. There's a guy who's really enjoying what he says is going to be his final season in Major League Baseball. We saw his round of applause for Austin Jackson earlier on the catch and a, a wry smile turning into a frown after that strikeout. Hanley Ramirez for ball one and here is that catch by Jackson in the second inning. Big man they hit it hard. But not quite hard enough. Nice play by Austin he goes back even David Ortiz can appreciate that effort. In the air right field Eaton is back and this ball has left into the bullpen. Hanley Ramirez makes it a one run game. He got a fastball about belt high on the outside part of the plate hitting just his second home run of the year but he's driven in 16. And so after finally finding a spot for him at first base he's trying to make the most of it as he reaches out our Ford home run replay and hits it a long way to the opposite field. Again the Red Sox have not been a big home run hitting team to start this season they have doubled quite a bit as Shaw pumps this one into row number one for strike one. What they've done is not only steal bases but they've run the bases very well they've been a much more aggressive team this year because they have the personnel to do it. Uki Betts is young enough Bogart's young enough. Bradley Junior young enough where used to be you couldn't find three young players in this lineup if you searched all day. Now you're finding a very productive system they haven't traded away their young talent they've kept them. That's why they become a speedier bunch. Ball to strike to Travis Shaw who's one of those young players 26 years old out of Kent State. Up to the majors last year at Bastion of Academia. Oh that yeah. is Kent State. Shattered bat shards everywhere. Quintana decides to flip it to Abreu two down and hopefully everybody escapes in good shape because that one went pinwheeling a long way into the stands. Jose gets inside on a fastball and the bat goes much farther than the baseball. So he couldn't get his hands out at all left there with just the handle of the bat. Perfect placement. So I didn't know where it was to start with, and it's easy after that. And apparently, everyone is okay. Thanks for celebrating free lumber night at the ball yard. See, when you're okay, you get to take a <laughs> selfie with the bat. That's <laughs> what good happens. Thing. Left side of the infield, Jimmy Rollins. And Chris Young bounces out to retire the side, but Hanley Ramirez, a solo homer. This is a one run ball game halfway home.
Uh, that's good. Yeah, all you can do is try, right, Stoney? I was one of the few guys that felt it was an unfair advantage for a pitcher to have a knuckleball, so I suspended my knuckleball, not like Ted Cruz. Ooh, very topical tonight. Well, I mean. <laughs> one strike to Austin Jackson. Get a journalism degree at uh, Kent State there. <laughs> Right field and Mookie Betts for out number one. Actually, I was thinking about being a history teacher. You were. Yeah, that didn't last that long, but it was a good thought. What uh, what derailed your history teaching career? Was it the baseball? My ability to throw a curveball, I believe. You're not sure. <laughs> it's your own it. life. Here's Adam Eaton, who has been on base twice, single and a walk. For Adam. He's also been right in the middle of both of the runs being scored. First time, leadoff base hit and eventually scored the first run and then pushed Jackson to second base, taking a walk in an inning that Wright walked three, one of them intentionally. Ball to strike for Eaton. White Sox had the off day yesterday. It was really Adam Eaton's first chance to hang out with his new son. A much appreciated and a timely day off for the Sox. And we were talking about, and Chuck just mentioned it, John Danks being designated for assignment in a couple of days. Part of Rick Hahn's conversation today was the fact that not only is he happy about the wins, but he's happy the way the team has played without an off day when you typically have four or five of them in April. They just had one. Kansas City had five. The Mets, I believe, had six. And the Sox were just the one, but it didn't slow the ball club down at all. Flashed foul by Eaton. That's Still one and two. That's a testament to a lot of times the starting rotation protecting the bullpen by going deep in the games. Because with 19 straight scheduled games after the first off day of the season, the only off day until yesterday, you can burn out a bullpen rather easily unless your top guys Chris Sale Jose Quintana unless they go deep into games. And they did just that. Helium ball to center from Eaton for Jackie Bradley. You can follow Dan Hayes White Sox insider all season long on CSNChicago.com presented by the great escape pools patio furniture hot tubs and more escape your everyday shop the great escape. Two down for Jimmy Rollins in the fifth inning. Last run across in the top half of this inning on a Hanley Ramirez solo homer. The alternative to having a bunch of off days in April is you get them backloaded. So the good news for the Sox here is that they will have significantly more off days than your average team at least significant in terms of percentage later this year. And the best part of when you have a whole lot of games scheduled early, you can sometimes wind up with two, three, or four rainouts and then subsequent double headers down the road. But the Sox only one game rained out, that against Cleveland, who comes here three times, so there wasn't a scheduling problem. Would you consider that even a rainout? Was it a snow out, sleet out? Inclement weather. But I, I think it was at the time a, a nice thing to have happen. So again because the Indians do come back a couple times probably would have hung around and waited to play that if it was a team from the east or the west. Fortunately it wasn't. Well if you have questions about the schedule we'll be joined by the commissioner coming up on Thursday. Rob Manfred will be here addressing Sox employees. He'll be at the game and he will join us in the booth. Ramirez backpedaling and all by his lonesome has out number three. Eight in a row set aside by Wright and a 2 1 score for the White Sox after five.
Racing in a Brayu four pack. Each pack includes four upper box game tickets, four hot dog value meals, and a parking pass. A Brayu four pack is available now for all Thursday home games. Visit whitesocks.com slash Abreu to order yours. That's also free T-shirt Thursday. The Abreu pack. Uh, Steve, have you extricated yourself from your headphone wire? During the break, you had tangled yourself in your electronics. I hope you're all right. Yes, we have much more length up here these days, and so you're able to get in much more trouble. As I was pivoting to see Los White Sox, the T-shirt we have up here. It's a nice shirt. It is. You look good in grayscale. Ryan Hannigan, veteran catcher, who's caught a couple of no-hitters in his career, both by Homer Bailey. Kitana off the mound, settles, knew he had time, and a smart play for out number one. Time now for Xfinity High Speed Action Replay. And Jackie Bradley Jr. hit the daylights out of one, but Adam Eaton, as he's done all season long, going back to make a great catch. And then deciding he was so happy he jumped out of the field of play. But estimated time of departure. He was retained by the wall. Ball one to Jackie Bradley Jr. You've had some nights on the mound that you've wanted to climb the wall and leave. Some of them. Well, some of them you do leave rather early. So. But not via not climbing that way. the wall. No. We have a fun edition of Sticks and Stone tonight, too, for you. As that ball is pounded into center field, into the ground. And Jackie Bradley Jr. is on with a one out single, the third hit tonight for the Red Sox. Bradley's been up twice, swung the bat very well twice. And he's one of those guys that has yet to be caught stealing. He's just two for two. The Betts and Bogarts. 11 for 11 combined. That's with six, Bogarts with five. So here is Marcus Lynn Mookie Betts. Got the nickname Mookie after the former NBA point guard Mookie Blaylock. Jordan era player. Adam Eaton circling and right, and he's in position to catch the second out of the visiting sixth. So far, just an excellent job by Jose Quintana, who's doing what he seems to do each and every time, which is get his team into the later inning. They have the one run lead, only three hits given up. The man at bat has one of them, and if you want to make sure he doesn't get another, don't throw him a fastball above the waist, hittable. See where Quintana starts him off. Bradley at first, two out, sixth inning in the series opener. That's outside, ball one. Last year he had some leg problems, and because he is one of those guys that can't sit around, he tried to get back and did get back a lot earlier than everybody expected. The problem was that he got hurt again. Tested the same spot and missed again, 2 0. And, oh. and unfortunately for the Red Sox and Pedroia, last year did not work out very well for him. Although the batting average was up, he only played in 93 games, and they really need this guy to be healthy and out there every day. That's a strike, 2 and 1. Well, there's a Boston team that's had some. Turmoil in the bullpen tonight. They get a member of that bullpen back with Carson Smith back from injury. Tough back end of that bullpen. Well, probably the best move that they could have done is what Dave Dombrowski did do. And they brought in a guy who throws 100 miles an hour on occasion, Greg Kimbrell. He's got eight saves. He's 
in pretty much all everything at the back end. You're not going to win without one of those guys. He's been very good wherever he's been. And he is certainly a guy that you never worry when you hand the ball too late in the game. His stuff is overwhelming. He was part of that Atlanta Braves everything yeah. must go sale. Which is still on if you want some of their players. They have their own prize shelf. Yeah, they're looking right, and they're, it's a human prize shelf. They're looking for <laughs> anybody that they can trade, and they're looking for not only draft picks, but young players trying to mine everyone else's farm system and rebuild on the fly. Except that they're not flying particularly well at this point, but they knew this is, a, you know, it's a painful process while you're trying to rebuild things. The six and 19 as it's two and two on Pedroia. And another throw to first that the Braves, uh, in fact, fouled up a transaction the other day. They wanted to call up Emilio Bonifacio from from AAA, but he had left a major league deal, signed a minor league deal with them, and it hadn't been 30 days. So they tried to call him up, couldn't call him up by rules. They played a, a man short. Pedroia goes down swinging. Quintana with a timely second strikeout, and away with the top of the sixth. Two-one White Sox. Of sticks and stone. How'd you do against Jerry Remy, oh, Steve? I, I wanted to do Butch Hobson. You did, but we can't, huh? We well, don't have the uh, the suggestion box. Jerry Remy was a spunky little left-hand hitter. I believe that I didn't do all that well. Don't think he hit any home runs, though. We'll see. Longtime color analyst and a good one. He has been there a while. And before the game, Joe Castiglione came into the booth. Mm -hmm. Longtime radio voice of the Red Sox. Dave O'Brien has shifted over to television yes. for the Red Sox. A guy that you're very familiar with from the days with ESPN and I worked with a couple of times. Yeah. Formed a nice partnership. He's with Steve Lyons today. Dave taking a quick swig here in the sixth inning and a wonderful announcer. Dave O'Brien. One of the best. He's very good at what he does and I think he's probably going to be in Boston for a long time. Knuckleballer Stephen Wright has an 0 2 count on Jose Abreu, who tripled in a run in the first. Longtime Red Sox fan, Kristen Pettit, looking on tonight. Not at all happy that her Sox are trailing. Our Sox are hoping that they were trailing by a little bit more. It's a difficult first drawer night. Too many Sox. <laughs> Upstairs, one and two on Abreu. That knuckleball just took off. Up over the head of Abreu. He wanted no part of the big man on that intentional walk in the third inning after throwing three, not really in the neighborhood. They put him on intentionally. 
One and two on Abreu. That's his first strikeout in four games for Jose. One down. Fifth strikeout for Wright. Good late movement. You see no spin at all. One of the reasons why the knuckleball is moving so well is the wind is blowing out. Todd Frazier is swinging a miss. What's the physics behind that? What's the reason for that? You just want to have the wind grabbing the seams. That's what makes it flutter. You throw with no spin at all, and when you slow it down and you look at it, it's the only pitch you're going to see with no spin on. And when that happens, you hope for higher seams on the baseball because the higher the seams, the more the wind will grab the ball, the more it will flutter. And because you don't know which way it's going to go, although some knuckleballers swear they can actually make it move by design, most of them just try to throw it over the middle of the plate and let nature take its course. Nearly caught Frazier with that pitch, two and one on Todd. So some people might be saying, well, then what's the skill of the knuckleball if you don't know where it's going? The ability to just Get it plateward and throw it in the zone. That's really the skill is can you control it? Call a strike, two and two for Frazier. That was a curveball, and certainly you can't possibly look for it. Only throws it about 5% of the time. Tipped foul. No, it's called strike three by the plate umpire. Every threw his hands up initially in order to call live ball. Frazier strikes out, and Robin Ventura wants an explanation. Looked like the initial call was foul ball. I don't believe that Todd would say anything if he didn't feel that he got a piece of it. Really hard to tell, but the ball actually dove beneath the glove of Hannigan. It sounded up here in live action like he ticked the baseball. Yeah, you can hear it, that. You can hear it before it hits the glove. So there's there's an audio tick of the baseball before it hits the glove. I think you yeah. can hear the tick beforehand. Unfortunately, you can't send the audio track to New York and have them <laughs> listen to it for about, oh, I don't know, six, eight minutes to see exactly what happened. So he does go down on strikes. Tonight's audio daily doubles comes in the sixth inning. How much would you like to wager, Steve? At that one, I would say I would wager quite a bit that he did make contact. You would. He's not going to get. Not going to be credited with that. That's where the knuckleball comes into play because and that's just a fastball. The ball's not going to drop like that. And, and the knuckleball is plausible right. that it could. And the umpire, probably if it was a fastball, would not miss that one. That ball is smoked to right field and down. In front of Mookie Betts and Melky Cabrera tests those brake pads. Two out single for Melky. Melky hit the daylights out of this one. That's because that was a fastball. So he scalds it to Mookie Betts, but realizing that Betts was really taken well to right field. And although you're going to force a throw, he's got to get back in a hurry. And yeah, Mookie Betts, a former infielder, now playing right for the Red Sox. And Hannigan behind the plate is under siege. Well, so far, nary a pass ball for him, which is coming in with seven of them. You'd have to figure so far it's been a triumphant night for him. One and one on Brett Laurie who walked to the second inning. It makes you doesn't it make you think about 
how easy catchers normally make it look when you see reactions to knuckleball pitchers. Well I think it's a remarkable position to play. I think if you can play it well you can probably get to the major leagues quicker than any other position. But it's by far the toughest physically demanding. The things you have to do to be a major league catcher the things you have to know about not only your pitching staff but all the other pitchers in the league all the hitters in the league. If you see somebody out of position sometimes you'll. Move somebody around. Lori tags this ball to center field Jackie Bradley has space. Cabrera stranded at first. Six innings gone tonight White Sox by a run in the opener. your Mexican heritage at the ballpark this Thursday with Cinco de Miller pre uh, presented by Miller Lite. The White Sox are offering specially priced tickets to celebrate Cinco de Mayo. The first 10,000 fans of the game will receive a t-shirt presented by Miller Lite. To purchase tickets visit whitesox.com slash Cinco. I just bit my tongue while I was doing that. I thought for a second I was reading that because yeah, that's I, usually how I read them. You I usually actually read them bit my very tongue well. while I was reading it. Well, You know this is a hazardous <laughs> job. Like your tongue. Alexander Bogarts against Quintana. Here in the seventh inning. Jose, by the way, in this game has allowed his first home run of the year. It took 35 innings to give up his first home run. Remarkable. And only three hits over six innings. So, pretty good job against the league's best hitting team to this point. Ball to strike on Xander Bogarts, who has that 11 game on base streak. You wonder, we said this earlier, that the Red Sox had the fewest plate appearances all year of any major league team against left handed pitching. How difficult is it to settle in against a lefty when you, you haven't seen many of them? I don't think it's, it's all that difficult. I do believe that. This is a terrific hitting team and you just have to make good pitches so it's not like they're being surprised by anything Q's thrown. It's just that he's thrown it very well. And Bogarts who last year hit 320 late in 156 games and drove in 81. Is such a strong young hitter that the only thing could stop him was his defense and now that they've smoothed that out. He's become one of the great young stars of the game. Twenty three years old Sander Bogarts. The biggest problem for the Red Sox was trying to find places for all of these guys to play because they've had to play a number of them out of position. First base pass to Brayu. Xander Bogarts is on leadoff man aboard for the first time tonight for the Red Sox. 
Let's tell the folks how you did against Jerry Remy. It's our answer to sticks and stone tonight. He was 12 for 31 against you. Yeah, left handers, little left handers usually did pretty well. A little lefties, huh? Yeah, I didn't strike him out at all, which is somewhat surprising. I didn't see him before the game. If I did, I would go over and give him a whack. <laughs> For those kind of numbers. That's what we call a sticks and stone, the home game, where, <laughs> where you get smacked by Steve. Where's Butch Hobson when I need him? Well, maybe we'll sneak him in okay. during the series. David Ortiz is the lead run. And he takes strike one. Shift is on in the infield, and you're pretty much hoping that the big man can get out in front of one and ground it to the right side. You see Rollins? Playing on the first base side of second. Laurie is still on the infield dirt. Normally he would be back on the grass. Well, Ortiz last time ran the count three and two, and Quintana uncorked a nasty breaking ball to freeze him for strike three. And one of the few curveballs he's thrown tonight. Ortiz is grounded into two double plays this year. Ball to strike for Ortiz. Sounded like, new bat. So, sounded like he broke his bat. That's because he did break his bat. Good inside fastball. He could hardly get it off his thumbs. And he'll get another. One and two for Ortiz. Bogarts at first, nobody out. Now one down. Another strikeout of Big Poppy. On our toe to pitch tracks, we'll take a look at the perfect place to pitch it. Another home run hitter, another uppercut swing. And if you can throw the ball above that uppercut swing, you're going to throw it by him quite a bit. Nobody. Nobody in baseball has used that high fastball put away pitch better than Jose Quintana. Started last year when he used it a lot, carried it over to this season. That's one of the reasons why he's been successful. And now the only man to dent the scoreboard against him steps in. Hanley Ramirez homered to right last time up. 2 1 White Sox in a battle of first place teams. Here's ball one, and here is the second pitch Ramirez saw back in the fifth. Got a fastball out away and took it into the bullpen. One ball pitch. Behind that fastball, one and one on Hanley Ramirez. Ramirez started with the Red Sox. And he was an international free agent signed in the year 2000 and then traded to the Florida Marlins in a huge deal with Josh Beckett and Mike Lowell coming back the other way. And Ramirez went on to star with Florida. Next year, he was the National League Rookie of the Year in 2006. Well, he hit 292 that year, and the next year hit 332. Also had a 342 year in 2009. He was something for the Marlins. That's before making the rounds to a few different teams. Two and one. Last year with the Red Sox, his first year after signing that big free agent contract, he got hurt. Played in 105 games and didn't do it all that well, hitting 249. Pitch number 83 coming from Quintana. Two and one, one down. Just low, three and one. All right. You know Quintana's stuff. You know Ramirez. Three and one, where do you go? I try to cut a fastball under his hands and try to get that ground ball to the left side. You get Frazier playing over toward the line. 
even though it's a wide open stance by Ramirez he's got to step toward the plate to defend against the outside pitch and they're going in. Center field Austin Jackson is there two down. There's a situation where you're trying to get the ball in you don't get it there but Ramirez hits it off the end of the bat so you got a couple of outs. And you're facing their very powerful young left hand hitter. Travis Shaw. Who's 0 for 2 with a foul pop out and a ground ball back to the mound. He showed the Red Sox last year why they should consider keeping him around. And that was because. He was able to hit 13 home runs in 65 games. 226 at bats. Lefties are just 5 for 37 this year against Quintana including tonight. And Shaw takes strike one. Last time he ran that fastball right in on his hands shattered his bat hasn't had the ball out of the infield yet. Shaw had a thought didn't go one and one. You got to show him that breaking ball away to set up that fastball in. That's where he would like to keep it and preferably if he goes in he'd like to keep it above the waist. Oh, a hook over the inside corner, one and two. Another mistake that he got away with because you see where Navarro wants it. He's sitting low and away, and this one spins over the inside part of the plate. And Shaw couldn't pull the trigger. Ball and two strikes, two down. Outside and low, two and two. Showing him a lot of curveballs here, Steve. I'd actually go back with another one. We'll take a look at what Navarro wants. He's look over in the dugout to see if maybe they have an idea. That's a high fastball. And that's where he's going to go. 2 2. Shaw got a piece. That went right into the broadcast booth next to ours, where I'm sure Dave O'Brien has called for some ice for his head. If not for his soft drink that he was finishing earlier. It was a high fastball. And Navarro giving him the fist pump. 2 2 set up outside. Fouled again by Shaw. He'll see a seventh pitch. So, a bunch of curveballs, a couple of fastballs high. What do you got here? One more curveball coming, and that's. I believe as the round looks at the feet of Shaw trying to see if he gets any closer to the plate. 2 2. Three balls two strikes. Been setting up low and away but throwing the high fastball and has not enticed Shaw to swing at one yet that he couldn't foul off. So Chris Young in the on deck circle. Remember on three and two earlier in the game the pitch to David Ortiz he looked at for strike three leading off the fifth inning. Bogarts at first with a leadoff single. He will be off on three and two with two out. Quintana is ready the pitch. First base and foul. Jose thought he could convince Mike Everett because that play happened in front of the bag. Anything in front of the bag, it's the home plate umpire's call. Anything in back of the bag, it moves to Tim Timmons, first base umpire. He was in fair territory, but the ball, unfortunately, was in foul territory. Pitch number nine will wait. Fourth best ERA in the American League coming in. Jose Quintana. Three and two, two out of the seventh. Check swing. And he went strike three. Quintana tap dances to stretch time.
Greater coverage of baseball brought to you by T-Mobile, and we'll take a look at some of the award winners around baseball for April. Manny Machado, the AL Player of the Month. You look at those numbers, they're gaudy. Jordan Zimmerman, the AL Pitcher of the Month, he was brilliant, just beating out Chris Sale. Bryce Harper, the National League Player of the Month, nine home runs, 24 driven in, and Jake Arrieta, who won tonight's game, the NL Pitcher of the Month. He now is 6-0. He was 5-0 with an ERA of 1 in April. And so we've got a new pitcher coming in the game. The career numbers of Carson Smith just off the DL. 3-5, 13 saves. And he is a side-wheeling right-hander. First pitch, Jerry Sands bounces to third. Travis Shaw. And one out. Check in during your visit to U.S. Cellular Field using MLB.com Ballpark, the official U.S. Cellular Field app for your phone, your Android smartphone, your iPhone. It perfectly complements your trip with ballpark maps, concession guides, check-in prizes, and more. Download MLB.com Ballpark today or visit WhiteSox.com slash ballpark app. You get the second half of that coming up. One down for Navarro. <laughs> That's a funky delivery from Carson Smith. It is that. Navarro bounced into a double play in the second and grounded back to right, the starting pitcher in the fourth. Ball to strike. Smith, a big man, 6'6, 215, last year with Seattle. Had a good run. 70 appearances, a 231 ERA, and a 2 and 5 record. You get out there 70 times, you are getting it done. Flexor strain had him on the DL to start this season. And with Kimbrell, who you mentioned, and Koji Uehara, who's been outstanding out of that pen as well. This it's not a team you want to trail in the eighth and ninth. No. Strong back end of the pen. Shortstop and Xander Bogarts for out number two here in the seventh inning. Austin Jackson, whose run scored in the third, is currently the differential to the plate. Mentioned the White Sox coming into play today, up three games on Detroit in the AL Central. It was the largest lead coming out of April ever for the White Sox. And Detroit came in second against the Indians tonight. Silver medalists this evening. Losing seven to three. Slid out hitting the tribe. Verlander went down to defeat. It's an Indians team without starting catcher Roberto Perez on the DL with a thumb injury. Trevor Plouffe is back from Minnesota, who will be in town Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the ever dangerous infielder. Injuries starting to take hold, certainly, as the Sox have experienced a few. Came out of spring training almost entirely healthy, but lately a couple guys getting nicked up. Daniel Webb pitched in one game, went on the DL. The really disappointing story of Kevin Smith, who was in the lineup for his major league debut that first day in Toronto and got scratched with a back injury. Yeah, that's pretty disappointing, and hopefully he will. Be able to get back, make that debut, and make it a successful one. Nifty pitch from Carson Smith, and he's got three up, three down in the seventh inning. Six outs to get for the White Sox, who are up 2 1 after seven.
upcoming schedule. It's the Red Sox for two more. Then they leave town, and the Twins, who are a different ball club than we saw starting the year where they couldn't hit. They can't hit now. The pitching has been kind of spotty, and then it's off to Texas for a very good Ranger team that's starting to play some pretty good baseball. So although we swept the Rangers in this ballpark, going down to Texas is usually a little bit different. I thought you were going to say the Red Sox were a different team than the Twins. I thought you were just making the delineation, but the Twins are a different team than they used to be. And the Red Sox are not. They ain't the as same, good as they once they're was. They're the same team they used to be. No need for the bullpen so far tonight for Jose Quintana. 93 pitches in, and the veteran Chris Young takes a strike. Do you see what the Cincinnati bullpen has done recently? The Reds just set a record since 1900. Their bullpen coming into tonight has allowed at least a run in 20 consecutive games. Well, they're in the bottom of the ninth in Cincinnati. They give one up tonight? Well, they're in second place, so we'll see. 1-1 one, one pitch to right field, Adam Eaton. A couple of steps, out number one. Sox bullpen up and going just in case. And it's Matt Albers who saw his scoreless streak go by the boards. He gave up a couple of runs. They were both unearned. But unfortunately for him, 30 consecutive appearances and 33 straight innings without giving up a run is history. All time Sox record, by the way, beating Jesse Crane's 29 straight appearances. One out for Hannigan, and the catcher watches a rainbow strike from Quintana. White Sox took the lead in this game in the first inning on an Abreu RBI triple. They doubled it with an RBI ground out from Frazier in the third. Oh, and two on Hannigan. Only run across for the Red Sox on a Hanley Ramirez homer. And by the way, the Reds did allow two runs in the eighth tonight. The streak continues. That's probably one where if it does go on for any more than five or six games you're probably not doing real well. Strike three called from Quintana he's punched out five. Boy he threaded the needle on the outside corner and Hannigan knew that he saw three perfect pitches and really had no chance. I mean all of these filled up the glove of Navarro who wanted them all away and they were all right there. So Hannigan just looks out. Not much you can do when a pitcher hits his spot perfectly and He's a strikeout victim. Pitch number 100 to Jackie Bradley Jr. This guy got to be careful with because out of everybody in this lineup, he's hit the ball the best. Only the seventh inning caused some difficulties. Lori into position. Four out number three. Quintana has 86, six in a row. To the home eighth looking for insurance.
Hachi Tozawa comes in the ball game, and there you look at some pretty impressive numbers on for the 12th time. Point nine three, six holes already. 12 strikeouts in nine and two thirds. He really does it with deception, as opposed to just flat out stuff. We'll face the top of the order for the Sox: Eaton, Rollins, and Abreu in the eighth. Bunt from Eaton and a beauty leadoff single. All Adam needs is probably 20 to 25 of those all year long, and he's going to hit 300 again. This is a perfect bunt. There's no chance at all for Shaw to do anything with it. It's far enough away from Tazawa where he can't get to it. And Adam Eaton beats it out, and he's the guy who bunted in a situation where Zach Britton went over, tried to field the ball in Baltimore. It led to the winning run. And that was a great bunt, only that one he dragged to the right side because he had a left hander on the mound. This one he stabs to the left side, and Rollins now. Who tried to bunt earlier, ready to swing away. Ball one. You like no bunt here? I like no bunt here. He hasn't had the ball out of the infield. However, they're not going to shift on him radically, which is something they normally do with Eaton at first base. That's upstairs. Two balls, no strikes on Rollins with a Brayu next. Jimmy Rollins has only seen Tazawa one time in his entire career. Two and zero oh this time around. Outside three and zero. Oh. Side corner three and one. Remember, this April the White Sox crushed Major League Baseball in runs scored in the seventh inning or later. More than 50 percent of their runs in April came in the seventh, eighth, ninth, or extras. Now we'll see if Eaton's going to be running. He's had a couple of looks at Tazawa. Three rounds calls timeout. Adam with three stolen bases he's been caught one time and he's getting a little bit bigger lead. Three and one. Eaton's off. Rollins fouls it left side. So Adam. Looks like maybe got scraped up a bit on that slide into second base. But he has to retreat to first. Janichi Tozawa on three and two for Rollins in a one run game. Time called, long hold from Tazawa. He was just trying to vary his look, so maybe take a half step in case Adam Eaton is running. You would think if he ran three and one, he'd be running three and two. And that's what Tazawa thought as he went to first base. Last year a tough year for him, two and seven, four fourteen ERA. This year in the early going, Tazawa's been a whole lot tougher than that. Three and two for Jimmy Rollins. Eaton runs. Rollins takes ball four. It gets to the backstop. Eaton racing for third. Hannigan's throw. Not in time. 
Boy, heads up base running by Adam Eaton as he didn't slow very much around second base. He had to take a peek back to see that ball getting away. Now, it looks like Farrell maybe wanted an appeal at third. I think he's got nothing to lose by the appeal. This is a pretty good throw by Hannigan. Remember, the call is safe by Jordan Baker, and there's Adam Eaton. He's in. I think he's in rather easily. I think what Farrell is thinking is maybe he popped off the bag. He didn't. Heads up play, and what Bogarts did was Bogarts was pointing into right field. That's a bit of deception that occasionally guys will do. Remember in the seventh inning and later, managers can ask for umpires to look at it on a replay via a close call. So you don't necessarily need your challenge late in the game here. The umpires do go to the review, and that looks like a very cut and dry call. Yeah, it? I think it's going to be really quick. I think it's going to be easy, and I think runners at the corners and nobody out. For the men in the middle, Rayu, Frazier, and Melky. Somebody very creative playing on instant replay humor is playing <laughs> let it be oh, it'll be over the PA here at US Cellular Field. Take a look at the front foot. It's in rather easily at third. And there will be an answer and it is let it be. First and third for the White Sox. In the eighth safe the call. From Mike Everett, the crew chief. And it looks like Farrell's coming out, and that's going to be it for Tozawa. Two batters, two base runners for Janichi Tozawa so far. Unless what he's talking about is what he wants to do if Jimmy Rollins takes off and goes to second base. He's leaving Tozawa in the game. So the bullpen had been up and going. Now that Boston Penn has nobody throwing. It was Koji Uehara who stood up, then sat back down. Abreu knocked in a run with a triple in the first. Infield in. All four positions. Ramirez. Holding close on Rollins at first base. Strike one on Abreu. Couple of division leaders on a Tuesday night in May. In a dandy of a ball game, well pitched. Certainly well defended. Owen one from Tazawa. Line drive left field and the lead expands. Eaton scores. Rollins was running. He comes home on a two run double for Jose Abreu in the eighth. Tazawa threw a fastball by him inside on the first pitch. Then he went to an off speed pitch even further inside and Jose was able to drop the head on it and take it into the corner. This looked like a splitter with Rollins going he's going to steal second base easily if there's no contact but he picked up the ball right away. See Joe McEwing saying get going no problem young can't get to it in time. Two more driven in by the big man giving him 17 for the year. I tell you what opposing teams are going to start asking if they can play six against the White Sox. The offense has been spectacular late in the game and with this one tough and tight all the way. Late runs. Some room to breathe with Frazier coming up and a breaking ball outside. Todd drove in a run in the third on a bouncing ball to third base.
downstairs 2 and 0. Oh. Remember one of the big catalysts for this ball club all season long has been Adam Eaton and he started this inning off with just a picture perfect bunt. Then running he realized the ball had gotten away from Hannigan he beat the throw into third base which set the stage for a two run double. 2 0. Oh. Frazier takes a strike. Well, the Sox have their best record through 26 games since 2006, and they got their 18th win this year on the same day as the 2005 team got its 18th win back on May the 1st. Two and one for Frazier. Abreu at second. This is actually the anniversary today of that 05 team who set the major league record by leading in 28 straight games to open the year. Had at least a lead in the first 28 of the World Series year when they set that record. If you think about it, though, that's remarkable. Two and two. Fastball, Frazier's willpower kicks in three and two. What an enjoyable team to watch. It's it's bad for traffic leaving the stadium because you can't go. <laughs> you gotta stay for all 27 now. Well, Contenta was wonderful through eight innings. Gave up a run on four hits. Walked only one against the league's best hitting team coming in. Ball four. Frazier works the second walk of the inning for the White Sox. And this is not the first time that the Sox have gone up against a late inning reliever. One of the premier setup men in this case for the Red Sox who had an ERA below one and they just ran into a buzzsaw late in the ball game. Two walks a single and a double here in the eighth and the Sox looking for more. Melky Cabrera one for three after lacing a single in the sixth. Ball one. Robin Ventura said it about a week and a half into the season. He said after that first long road trip I wanted guys to stop swinging at balls out of the zone and the patience has increased as the winning has continued for this team. At six walks tonight. That was something at various times over the last couple of years. You could go four or five games and not see that many walks. Certainly not in one game. I mean, you just, it's a different team. And the patience that they show, and also the aggressiveness when they're in a situation. That calls for that has been remarkable. Maybe right here, two and zero oh from Tazawa, two on, and he steps off. This was a two-one game, four batters ago. Two and zero. Oh. It's low as well. Three balls, no strikes, with Laurie on deck. A two to one game looking like it would be anything but a comfortable ninth inning because it was the top of the order. Betts, Pedroia, Bogarts, anybody gets on, the big man, David Ortiz coming up. But that's before a little 40 foot rolling bunt opened this inning off. Down the shoot for strike one. So Eaton the bunt, Rollins a walk, Abreu the double. He's driven in three tonight and has an RBI in four straight. Starting to pile on the numbers now, Jose Abreu. Three and one to Melky with nobody out. Tazawa. Pitches foul back. Good one to hit, three and two. 
this fastball right down the middle and unfortunately Melky did fall it back very hittable pitch. Now they'll reset. 20 pitches already in the inning for Janichi Tozawa. Three and two. Here comes. Hit foul again off the facade. The last thing John Farrell wants to do at this point of the ball game is go into that bullpen again, knowing that you get a couple more coming up, and then over the weekend, your team does not have any off days coming up for a while. Boston plays every day from Today, the third through the 18th of May. Not an off day in sight. Three and two. Melky stays alive. Tomorrow, 7 10 start time, Clay Buckholes, Carlos Rodon, Henry Owens, Eric Johnson scheduled starters on Thursday. Six game homestand beginning with a flourish tonight at U.S. Cellular Field. Three and two. Travis Shaw at third. Safe! Melky Cabrera busting it down the line, beats it out. If you had Melky Cabrera infield single in the eighth, go to the window. Two hits for Melky, and he's sniffing a base hit here as he pounds it. Shaw with only one play because he can't see in back of him to realize where Abreu is, so he's got to come to first base. And he does. And Melky beats the play. Now, Farrell has gone out there to have a word with Timmons. Maybe he wants him to look at it, but. Could very well be fresh out of challenges. If you're reading lips, he said, I mean, I'm making a move anyway. And they are going to go look at this. That's a close play at first. It is that. We shall see what replay unearths on that possible infield single. Question is, when is it in the glove? That might be stands. It's really close, and you have to have definitive proof. The call on the field by Tim Timmons is that he was safe. And you'd have to, if that is indeed construed as in the glove, which from that angle you can't really tell if it's just before the glove or in the glove, but Melky's foot is just coming down as that ball arrives, and so. We'll see if the proof is conclusive. Either way, runners are going to be at second and third, or the base is loaded. Again, your point is is the key one here. The call on the field is safe, right. so you'd need definitive proof to overturn. I would think if the call was out, you wouldn't have definitive proof to overturn it that way. Let's see if it works out this way. And Melky. A very interested spectator. He's got a vested interest in this. And he calls him out. Out. Wow, that's that's surprising considering the looks we had. Yeah, very, very close. So Tazawa walks out. We'll step out and be back after these messages.
box seats get the StubHub app. They take the price and location of seats and show you which tickets at StubHub give you the best deal. Get the StubHub app today. Bullpen time a little deeper for the Red Sox, Steve. Time now for the Midas Tire and Auto Service experts call to the pen. And it's Matt Barnes out of the University of Connecticut on for the 11th time. ERA just below three, one and one with a hold. 13 strikeouts in 12 and a third, which is pretty good. Six walks, a little bit high. He inherits runners at second and third, the infield in at all four positions, and he's looking in at Brett Laurie. Tazawa just the third of an inning. Barnes and Lori to Tango. Ball one again to be clear. After the seventh inning begins on close plays the crew chief may review based on the suggestion of a manager on his own so it can arise from the field you don't need to have a challenge so even though the previous review didn't overturn the call the Red Sox were able to request the challenge here leading to the out from Melky Cabrera strike one to Lori ball and a strike outfield straight away young fairly shallow in left field for a guy with the power of Red Laurie he was homered in three straight games trying to keep that streak alive longest of his career one one it's outside two balls and a strike with Jerry Sands next Barnes has given up a home run in 12 and a third Odin's batting average against which is always a good sign of the stuff you have is 286 which is a high number. Said Jerry Sand scheduled on deck Carlos Sanchez has come out of the dugout as a possible pinch hitter. It's off the plate and Mike Everett has had a very strong night behind the plate tonight. Well he had one guy throwing with a White Sox uniform on that was throwing almost all strikes just one walk. And the other guy was a knuckleballer, which is very difficult to call. You got to stay with everything because you don't know where it's going to go. And he's done a nice job. Abreu at third, Frazier at second. Two runs in in the eighth. Ball four to Brett Laurie, his second walk tonight, and the bases are loaded. Seventh walk for the White Sox this evening. Third of the inning, and it sets it up for Carlos Sanchez, who had a huge pinch double in Baltimore. That was in game three of the four game series. Sanchez came up in the eighth inning, led off the eighth, then Abreu drove him in. Frazier, a two run homer, a three run eighth inning, and an eight seven. Sox win on the road. That was a thrilling game. That was a, a big need win, too. You lose the first yeah. two. It Sale was. going the next day. And it helped turn things around. I think the guys in Baltimore felt that was a pivotal game for them, knowing that Chris Sale was going the next day. And knowing that they had fought back, it was seven to five. They came back. A couple of a couple of plays that probably should have been made that weren't. And then Davis with a huge double to tie it up, only to see yet another bunt by Adam Eaton start off the key run. Just as it happened tonight here in the eighth inning to build on the lead. Former first round pick Matt Barnes out of Connecticut. And time called. <laughs> oh, and two. The honor Navarro scheduled next. The 
Lori, Frazier, Abreu, bases loaded. Barnes shakes off Hannigan. And he's got strike three on a ball in the. No, he tipped it. No, he tipped it. Tip foul. So still 0 and 2 on Sanchez. Well, Carlos doesn't go anywhere, so he realized he got a piece of it. Ever so slightly, he got a piece of it. Good curveball from Barnes. So Sanchez stays alive. Oh and two. Now a ball and two strikes. Getting it up there 98 miles an hour to go with that good curveball. Get a pretty good idea why he was a number one draft pick. Just one slot after Sonny Gray back in 2011. Matt Barnes, 19th overall. Sanchez lays off two balls, two strikes. Last year he started a couple games for these Red Sox. He started five games at Triple A before they made him a, a full-time reliever. Two two. Foul from Sanchez. Making him work. Red Sox came in at first place. White Sox came in at first place. First time they've met as division leaders since 2005. Two two from Barnes. Sanchez spoils it. He'll see an eighth pitch. That was a good curveball. That one biting low and in. He was able to just. Get a piece of the baseball. Baltimore has already won their game against the Yankees, so Boston knows that if they don't come back in this one, they're going to give away for the evening at least first place. Sox with a chance, the White Sox, to move their lead in the Central to four with the Tigers' loss tonight. They fell to the Indians seven to three. Kansas City also is trailing late home against the Nationals. 2 2. Called strike three. Two out. Perfect pitch. And on the outside corner by Barnes after a couple of snapping, breaking balls, and that one just caught the corner. The Toyota pitch tracks will show you that it's right there. Well, you said it earlier. The Red Sox have Betts, Pedroia, and Bogarts in the ninth inning. So putting the card anywhere near the horse is a bad idea. Yeah, David Robertson, one of the guys listening in the pen. And so you certainly would think a base hit here, and he sits. Jose Quintana, his longest start of the season, he's gone eight full. In this series opener, and now Barnes wants to talk to Hannigan. This is the most negative reaction a conversation will ever get. The fans here want to get on with him. They want to see that 19th win in the bag. Three outs to get. And Navarro a chance to cushion the lead. Ball outside. This inning, bunt single walk, double walk, ground out walk, strikeout. Walk, right? That's how it sets up. But I'm thinking that the other's going to be swinging. Oh. 
upper reaches of the zone one and one. And surprising with the curveball that Barnes has he has not thrown a wild pitch this year because you throw that in the dirt. It's awfully tough to corral. Two pitches upstairs. One out of the zone one in the zone. Bases loaded two down one and one on Navarro. Fades away two balls and one strike. They almost expect runs late in games now. But they've done a pretty good job of it. 2 1. Upstairs, three balls and a strike. But one more out of the zone, and the save goes by the boards, but certainly nobody in the bullpen going to be complaining about that. Matt Albers will get an inning with another run or two. David Robertson will get a save opportunity with a third out. Three and one from Matt Barnes, who's been up and out to Navarro. Three one. Three and two. Might have been ball four. Every pitch up. Borderline and no contact. So the big advantage, the runners will be going. All three of them. Three balls, two strikes. Barnes, two. Navarro, the pitch. In the air, foul. The White Sox with the bases loaded have forced 42 pitches in the eighth inning from Tazawa and Barnes. It's been a remarkable team late in the game tonight no exception. This the 43rd pitch eighth batter of the inning three and two on Navarro. He's going to battle him some more out of play. Well the White Sox came into this game 12th in Major League Baseball in pitches seen per plate appearance and that is likely to increase after not only this inning but this game which has featured seven White Sox walks. I've been doing to the Red Sox what the Red Sox have habitually done to American League pitchers which is patient at bats. Three and two. Foul again, first base side this time. It'll be pitch number nine to Navarro. These defenders have been out in the field for 35 minutes. I think the 40 minute mark would be okay. <laughs> Keep him out a little longer. You're a nice guy. Three and two. Here we go. Navarro slugs it center field, playable for Bradley. And with that, the inning comes to an end. Two runs, pad the lead, 4 1, three outs to get.
Brought to you by Miller Light, and here's our Miller Moments. And it's a night of Jose Quintana, who didn't have a strikeout through the first four innings. And then he got David Ortiz looking, and then he wound up with five of them. What a brilliant performance that Laurie putting away a one hop rocket off the bat of Jackie Bradley Jr. Eight innings, one run, four hits. Just one walk and five strikeouts. Our Miller moments as David Robertson comes into the ball game looking for save number nine in his 10 opportunities. On for the 12th time is ERA point 79 with 14 strikeouts in 11 and a third. And he's got to start at the top. The first three he's going to face are right handers. For Jose Quintana it's his longest start of the season and his longest since his final outing last year in this ballpark September 30th a complete game against the Kansas City Royals. Just a terrific job against a team that came in red hot offensively the last eight games they were hitting everything in sight hitting 308 as a team. Robertson misses the target for ball one to Mookie Betts who was 0 for 3 against Quintana. Only one ball left the infield. Now the Red Sox had won three straight series. They swept the Yankees and mashed the ball in the process. Two and zero from Robertson. Right down the pipe. Two and one. Cued foul two and two to the 23 year old Mookie Betts. David Robertson's fastball has a little cut to it. And if you think that's a coincidence, he paid an apprentice behind Mariano Rivera. Maybe the best cut fastball in the history of the game. And he learned a little something from the great right hander. Frazier at third to his left for out number one. Join the free White Sox .com blacklist for exclusive club content all year long, including ticket offers, breaking news, special event invites, and more. Visit White slash blacklist to register. I don't know about you. I'd want to be involved in any list with this team right now. It's just an exciting team to watch because not only do they do most things right but they got a starting rotation leading the league in earned run average they have a bullpen that's been close to unhittable they score more late runs than anybody in the game percentage wise and we've seen it all on display tonight we've also seen some wonderful defense all the way around Adam meeting with another great play in right field Todd Frazier with a couple of good ones at third base and Austin Jackson with a terrific play in center field to rob Big Poppy. One and two on Pedroia, who's one for three with a single strikeout and flyout. The Sox bullpen entered tonight leading the major leagues with a 160 ERA, 13 earned runs in 73 innings. One, two. Flashes inside. Two balls, two strikes on Pedroia. And we talked about it earlier in the game. That's where a starting rotation can protect the bullpen. As you go deep enough in games and don't leave that pen too many ounces to cover, they're not going to get overly tired. They're going to be strong each and every time out, and this pen has been that way. Harmless ground ball, Lori to Abreu, and the Sox of White are one out away tonight. It's up to Xander Bogarts. The Red Sox looked like they might be threatening in the seventh inning because this young man singled to lead off against Quintana, who then got two strikeouts and a lineout. Robertson for strike one.
The Red Sox had won three in a row. Big the White first, Sox two in a row. Yeah, big first game of the series, big first game of the homestand. And one out away from putting it in the win column. Only one swing tonight brought home a run for the Red Sox. It was Hanley Ramirez on a solo homer in the fifth. The White Sox have led tonight wire to wire, scoring in the first and third, and two more for good measure in the eighth. Ramirez is in the hole. Two strikes on Xander Bogarts. Two teams at the tops of their divisions. Check swing. Bogarts went around and the White Sox win the opener by the count of four to one. John Farrell not particularly happy with Mike Everett. But he hasn't been real happy all night because his team at least tonight got outplayed in every aspect of the game. So we'll take a look at Bogarts as he tries to check it up. And not even to appeal to first base, Mike Everett said, Yes, indeed, you did. And that's all it took for save number nine, running Quintana's record to four and one. And Jose, for the first time in as long as I can remember, not that worried about no decisions any longer. He's piling up the decisions. Chris Sale, Jose Quintana, and Matt Litos are 14 and one, and they've allowed 20 earned runs in 111 and a third. Well, it's been a remarkable run by all of the pitching staff. They couldn't have done it without the spectacular defense that we've seen early. And once again, the Sox come home, enjoy only the second off day of the season, and then run into yet another red hot offensive ball club. It's been four series in a row where they were facing teams that were loaded with bangers in the middle of their lineup. It started with Texas. And a sweep of the Rangers, then Toronto on the road, and a sweep of the Blue Jays in their ballpark where they hit home runs in abundance. Then it was on to Baltimore, who was in first place at the time and second in the league in hitting behind the team that has come into our fair city and lost the first game of their three game series. Well, it may be a fair city, but it's not terribly equitable to play at U.S. Cellular Field as a road team right now. The White Sox have won. Three in a row overall with that sweep against Texas. They've won four straight at home. And 4 1, the final score is Sierra Santos is downstairs with Deonor Navarro. Hello, Sierra. Hey, guys. Just one. Just one run and four hits for Jose Quintana tonight. Outstanding. He went 20 scoreless innings before that. Okay. The home run. So, how consistent has he been? Unbelievable. Um, this guy, his preparation before every game, before every start, is off the charts, and he knows what it takes. You know, I'm just back there having fun, doing my thing, and he just make my love, he just make my job look a lot easier. It's been said that he's one of the most underrated pitchers in baseball right now. Do you think that's going to change? Could be. I would love to stay the way it is right now. Nobody paying attention to him and. Him doing his thing, you know. Um, we got a great team, and we got a lot of go a lot of good things going our favor. So we just got to keep playing the same way we've been playing. When you've got a pitching staff like this, how fun is it to be behind the plate? Unbelievable, you know. Every day you got an opportunity to do something special, and and that's what we try to do. All right, that's Melky with the sunflower seeds. Yeah, We're going to send it back coming. to you guys up Thank in the booth. Uh, how about that, Melky Cabrera? With uh, the sunflower seed shower again for Deonor Navarro, who has been pelted many times on our postgame report already this year. Well, he's done a great job behind the plate, and a lot more pressure has fallen to him because Alex Avila has a hamstring difficulty. So Deonor getting a chance to play most every day. Very good behind the plate, framing pitches well, calling a game exceptionally well. And what we're seeing now is one of the most exciting teams in baseball. You want to do it again tomorrow? I'm so excited I'm going to be back tomorrow. All right, I'll see you here. How about it? So, for our entire crew, for director Jim Angio, our producer Todd Benjaminson, our associate producer Dave Ross, our tech manager Mark Harper, 
our executive producer Jim Corno Jr. and our entire crew. For my partner Steve Stone, I'm Jason Benetti saying so long from U.S. Cellular Field. Coming up next, Subaru Post Game Live with Chuck and Bill, and you've been watching another White Sox win. 4-1 at Chicago White Sox Baseball on Comcast Sportsnet. Good night.